Welcome back to another episode of the Dr. V Podcast, where we talk about all things wellness, wisdom, and warfare. I'm your host, Jesse Verga, and today I have a very, very special piece on warfare for you, specifically about the Ukraine-Russian conflict and all of the information that seems to conveniently be left out of every news article, every video, every coverage story on this conflict. Over the last few years, the world has watched this you know, conflict escalate. We've seen the US and NATO both get involved, both supply Ukraine with armament, and no one has really talked about it. So today, I'm going to be challenging this dominant narrative and give you guys an alternate perspective, just some pieces of information that I think are important that should be covered by somebody at some point in time before we end up in a full-blown war with Russia. So with that, let's get into it. Hey, did you guys know that at the end of this video, there is a riddle and there has been a riddle at the end of every single one of my videos every single week. Now in the past, I would leave you guys the answers. I have decided to remove the answers from being at the end screen. And now the first person to correctly answer the riddle in the comments below, I will pin that comment. And maybe one day when this channel grows and I get some sponsors, I'll be able to give you guys some free stuff for guessing the riddle correctly. But with that, let's get back into the video. Let's start by setting the stage with a little bit of historical context. So I want to go back towards the end of the Soviet Union. And this is going to be quick for anybody out there who doesn't want a history lesson, but it is important to understand since the fall of the Soviet Union, NATO has steadily continued to move eastward. It has absorbed 14 former Soviet Union or Eastern Bloc countries since 1999. And this expansion is a little bit of an issue for Russia, right? Because Russia considers NATO enemy number one and NATO is slowly creeping to its borders. And mind you, when the Soviet collapsed, NATO gave kind of like informal assurances that it would stay away from its border. Soviet was like, listen, y'all won, we get it. Do us a favor, don't come at our doorstep. And what did NATO do? They said, sure, yeah, no, no, we won't, we won't move eastward. And then they proceeded to move eastward directly against what they originally told Russia. This is on record. And then we have Ukraine in particular, which is a flashpoint, right? Ukraine is up against the Russian border. So after the 2014 Maiden Revolution, which saw the pro-Russian president, Viktor Yanukovych, I'm probably saying his name wrong, but this Viktor guy was ousted. Russia responded by annexing Crimea. If you guys know anything about this conflict, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And Russia basically backed the separationists in Eastern Russia, these pro-Russian Ukrainians, basically. By 2015, though, over 14,000 lives had already been lost in the Donbas region alone. So this kind of like internal struggle within Ukraine has a long history. But this is the history that a lot of people in the quote-unquote West will call it, NATO and United States, that seem to forget and seem to leave out of these news stories or just simply ignore when they're discussing the Ukraine-Russian conflict. Just like what's going on in Palestine, this is, there's a long history there. This is not like a brand new thing. And I think this is just another indictment of the education system, but these are things that we need to consider when we're talking about this conflict. We have to understand Russia's perspective as well. Again, know thy enemy, right? You have to understand what's motivating your enemy. And if Russia is the enemy, we need to understand what's motivating them, what's pissing them off, and why are they so violently charged at Ukraine? Well, this has been going on for a very long time. In 2021, when Ukraine started talking about joining NATO, Russia was like, hold the fuck on, right? Y'all have been moving eastward, even though you said you weren't going to, well, we got to draw the line somewhere. And that red line is Ukraine joining NATO. That would be like if Russia took over Mexico. The United States would be like, hold up. That's too close to our borders. It's bad enough you guys are just over the Bering Strait. You know, y'all are close on that side, but if you guys are going to actually take over and occupy Mexico, we got a problem. And that is all Russia is saying right now, is that if Ukraine joins NATO, that is a bit of a problem for them. Well, unfortunately, that's a problem. If a NATO membership for Ukraine represents like an existential threat to Russian security, and again, the West is completely ignoring this, even though Russia has made it abundantly clear that they don't want a NATO country on its border. So let's talk about NATO and the United States. 
Since the start of the conflict, which is about February 2022, the U.S. has provided $44 billion in military aid. And I'm just going to say that again. $44 billion. We are sending money to Ukraine like we got it like that. Like we are not broke right now in a ton of debt. We are broke, broke, broke. But we seem to have enough money to feed a military industrial complex. Just throwing that out there. And some of the aid that we're providing are things like long range missile systems like the HIMARS or the Javelin anti tank missiles, right? These are being used directly against Russia, and Russia has a little bit of a problem with that. Hey guys, I wanted to interrupt this video real quick and remind you that my free guide, Wellness, Wisdom, and Warfare, A Veteran's Guide for Mastering Life, is now available for download using the link in the description, or if you go to my website, jessieverga.com slash free guide, or it's under the podcast tab, you can download it for absolutely free. It's over 60 pages of just tips and tricks and things to help my veterans out there master their health, master their fitness, master their mental and spiritual health, just things that I've learned through my journey as just a veteran and that I've learned as an educator and as a professional in multiple fields, as an entrepreneur. I put all these things in one place and I've put it together for absolutely free. So again, link is in the description or if you head to my website, jessieverga.com, you can download it for absolutely free. Free. I just want to also make it clear that it's not just the U.S., right? It's NATO also. So the U.K. has pledged nearly $1.5 billion. And I'm not I'm not too sure why the U.S. had to, like, outdo everybody. We sent $44 billion. The U.K. sent $1.5. We sent so much more than them because we are the, mili we are the military leaders of NATO. We're the big army, Marine Corps, military presence, and we're supposed to be helping all of our folks. But... My question is why? Why are we pouring billions of dollars into this con conflict? Ukraine is not a member of NATO. We have no formal defense obligations towards Ukraine and helping them defend themselves. So yet we're like sticking our necks out for them. We're funding a war that doesn't seem to even have an end in sight. So why are we doing that? So my question is always going to be why? Whenever I'm trying to analyze a situation, I usually do something called asking the five whys. Why did this happen? Okay, well then why? So why is there a Ukraine-Russian conflict? Why is the United States getting involved? Why are we sending $45 billion in aid? Why is the UK sending $1.5 billion in aid? Why are we doing all of these things for Ukraine, who's not even a member of NATO? They are not the homies. So I'm just trying to figure out what, what's going on here. And if your inner self is not screaming, military industrial complex, politicians have cronies that work for Raytheon and all these big companies and Grumman and whatnot. It should be because that's the answer. But I digress. While all of this is happening over in Ukraine and while we're sending all this money over there, we got shit happening at home. We have inflation. We have economic challenges just in general, but you know, healthcare costs, infrastructure problems. So can you imagine if we put $44 billion into that? Can you know what, you know, some of the problems that we're having, if we just gave it some financial attention, I'm not saying throwing money at the problem is the solution, but can you imagine if we tried to combat and solve some of our own problems before we ran to help some random country? Like, can you imagine how much better off our country would be? Like, why are we prioritizing a war overseas that has no clear impact on our national security? Now, yes, the Russia-Ukraine conflict does have does affect the geopolitical landscape we are directly involved in. There are some rising costs and some things that are directly influenced by this conflict, but not enough that it should cost us $44 billion, in my opinion, and not enough that we should be threatening a war with Russia. But let's take a step further back and let's, let's talk about NATO, right? Instead of maybe diplomatic avenues, NATO has consistently just straight up chosen military support for Ukraine. Since 2022, the West has sent, again, hundreds of millions and billions of dollars in military aid, escalating the conflict and making negotiations damn near impossible. But Russia has been asking for negotiations. They have been saying, hey, let's not escalate this. Russia has a whole other world of problems on their home front, right? And they are trying to work on that aspect of things. They don't have time, funding, or the support of their people 
to enter some sort of war with a neighboring country. So they have been asking for negotiations, but we have Western military aid just continuing to flow into to Ukraine, which is essentially us digging our heels in and saying, now we're going to fight this. So Russia's like, well, if you don't want to talk about it, then we're going to have to fight it too. This is how our military aid is continuing to escalate this war and causing this war to just drag on. But it's not just a military issue, right? It is an issue of sovereignty. Russia argues that Ukraine's alliance with NATO and the European Union threatens its sovereignty and security. Again, going back to my Russia taking over Mexico example, that would be a threat to the United States sovereignty and security. If enemy number one was straight up right across the border. That is a problem for us as well. So if we put ourselves in their shoes, it's like, well, yeah, that makes sense. And again, it's important to remember, Russia considers NATO a hostile force. So a hostile force at its borders is going to be a problem. Oh, trust me, that's a problem. By us arming Ukraine, we're not just supporting a sovereign nation's right to defend itself. We are actively participating in what's called a proxy war, which risks pulling NATO directly into a conflict, potentially a nuclear conflict with a nuclear armed Russia. Because Russia's like, okay, how is Ukraine able to attack us? Well, it's cronies over in NATO are giving it military supplies. So what would be the best military strategic move for Russia? Cut off its supplies. It's not rocket science. It's depressing, but it's not rocket science. You don't have to be commander in chief or commander of military forces to know that that makes fucking sense. But since we're speaking of nuclear weapons, let's just talk about how Russia is the largest nuclear power with nearly 6,000 warheads. Maybe we should bring that up. If we wanna, if we wanna talk about Russia, we might as well talk about kind of a little bit of the, why they're such a threat. Earlier this year, Russia made it clear that if the Western military involvement continues, specifically if the United States continues to provide long range missiles to Ukraine, it would fundamentally alter the nature of this conflict, potentially leading to nuclear ex escalation. Russia makes tons of threats, but they're dead ass about this one because now Ukraine is actively killing its citizens. Earlier this month, so September, 2024, Putin himself straight up said that if Ukraine were to strike Russia, with any of the missiles supplied by the West, particularly the United States, that it would pull the West directly into war. That again is a red line and it's terrifying to think about because they have warned us about this. And then we turn around and have the Biden administration saying that they are working out whether to lift restrictions on the long range missiles that we've provided to Ukraine. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, basically when we gave these missiles to Ukraine, we told them, these are for defense only. If Russia is knocking at your door, you can answer with these. But now Ukraine is like, yo, we kind of want to hit them first. From a military standpoint, that makes sense, but not with borrowed shit. It's not your stuff. And with Putin's warning, we should not even be working it out. So the fact that this administration is thinking about it is fucking terrifying. When Putin straight up said, don't fucking do that. If you do that, this is going to get a lot worse for everybody. And I don't know if we're, if it's like a power play, us working it out, but it's a problem. We shouldn't be working out shit. We should have st stood firm and said, hey, listen, Ukraine, we don't mind helping you, but you can't use our shit to attack Russia. It's just to defend yourself because we're not trying to put our country and our citizens at risk and enter a war that could cost us millions and trillions of dollars. It would cripple this country. Speaking of crippling the country, let's talk about the costs, not just the economic costs, but the human costs. The global impact of this conflict has been substantial. We are kind of, we're feeling kind of some aftershocks of it, but Europe, Africa, Asia, they're seeing an increase in fuel costs. They're seeing an increase in food costs. You know, their supply chains are disrupted because of this conflict. And I'll leave a link to this in the description, but there is a oil pipeline map that is totally public. It shows kind of how the oil pipelines from Russia through Ukraine and through Eastern Europe, how all of Europe, the European Union and a lot of Eastern um, or Western Asian countries are dependent on these oil pipelines. And a lot of that's getting disrupted because of the conflict. So it's almost like it's in everyone's best interest for this conflict to be over, for Ukraine and Russia to negotiate. Because all Russia is trying to do is prevent Ukraine from becoming a NATO country. And all Ukraine has to do is be like, all right, we get it, come to some sort of negotiation terms. But instead, Ukraine is continuing to stay on the defense 
and now on the offense, which we'll talk about in a second. So Russia has straight up attacked Ukraine's electrical grid. They've attacked their grain infrastructure. They've attacked and disrupted grain exports, which is causing food shortages in Ukraine. Everything that Ukraine has done has been kind of fucked up. Like if you're a Ukrainian citizen, I can understand why you would just want to leave. Over 8 million Ukrainians have already fled the country. They fled Ukraine with another 5.9 million internally displaced. Because what Ukraine did is they secured their borders, which obviously to keep Russians out and to kind of enter a stronghold, but also to keep people in. Because what ha what's happening now is the men of Ukraine and the people of Ukraine don't want to fight anymore. They are laying down their guns and deserting. So Ukraine doesn't have the numbers and they're forcing their men to fight. And the men are like, do I want to die at the hands of Russia on the front line? Or do I want to go home and spend the last few moments with my family and just die when Russia gets to me at home? They're choosing their family. And that makes sense. There's no incentive for them. Morale is shit. They're fighting this war that they don't believe in all because... Ukraine had talks about joining NATO. All, all Ukraine has to do is become Switzerland 2.0 and be neutral. And there, it's a win-win for everybody. Just don't fucking get involved. But they're getting involved for some fucking reason. On September 12th, 2024, the Red Cross said that they had lost three workers killed by Russian shellings in Donsk. Every day this war continues, more lives are lost, more families are being torn apart. So prolonging this war through endless military support is only adding to the suffering. That's all the US is doing. That's all NATO is doing. And I know Ukraine took like 300 of their soldiers and moved into Russia and took over a town and everybody in the media is like, yeah, go Ukraine, show them who's boss. Like you guys think Ukraine can take on Russia without our support. The only reason why they were able to do that is because they have Western you know, and US weapons, but it was so fucking stupid. They took 300 of their soldiers, of soldiers that they don't even have enough of, off the front line, off of the Ukrainian homeland, moved them into Russia, and directly threatened Russia. There's this thing in war where it's either just or unjust. Up until Ukraine entered Russia, Russia was kind of unjust in this war. They invaded Ukraine because Ukraine threatened to join NATO. That was not a good move on Russia's part. That was unjust. But now that Ukraine is in Russia and directly threatening Russia's homeland, now it's considered just. Now they have a right to defend themselves. No questions about it. If Russia came into the United States, we would have a right to defend ourselves. The only way to defend ourselves is to attack. They're basically giving Russia the incentive to attack them. And by the way, when Ukraine entered Russia and took over this town and there's all this talk about Russia had to send all of these military aid and military transport to get their people out. It was because the Ukrainians were killing Russian civilians. They weren't, there was no military in this town. The small little military number that were there, the police force that was there, they straight up were like, oh, you guys got it. They knew they, you know, they knew the hundred people that they had were outnumbered by the 300 people that Ukraine sent. And then when the Ukraine, when the Ukrainians came in, they started killing civilians and then they claim that it was like some big feat. It's like, no, it's not. You used Western, you used American weapons to kill civilians in Russia and just piss Russia off even more and now give them incentive and the ability to start a justified war. What is the alternative, right? I've given you a ton of problems. I've shown how Ukraine has really pissed off Russia and how we have gotten ourselves involved because we just got to be involved in everybody's motherfucking problems. So the answer, the alternative is diplomacy. This is going to be unpopular, an unpopular opinion in certain circles, right? We know the de Democrats love the military industrial complex. We know the Republicans benefit off of it too, right? There's no political party in this that isn't like secretly loving the fact that, that we're providing military weapons for this Ukrainian-Russian conflict. But negotiating settlement is really the only way to solve this conflict. Russia has definitely expressed its willingness to negotiate because all they want is for Ukraine to be neutral. Ukraine is not going to be on Russia's side, is not going to be on NATO's side. They're going to remain neutral, as should every neighboring country around Russia. They should remain neutral because they're no longer a threat to Russia or to us. And Russia has shown interest in this idea. They're like, okay, if Ukraine stays neutral, we'll back out. 
this conflict will be over. They'll sign a peace treaty or whatever the f and Ukraine will promise to stay neutral. But it's going to require a serious engagement from both sides and NATO needs to stay the f out of it. We seriously cannot keep ignoring Russia's serious and genuine concerns and we can't expect the conflict to end by just continuously throwing weapons at it. There has to be, there's no side's gonna win. It's gonna be utter bloodshed until one side just doesn't have enough people to fight. So we should be able to use our big girl and big boy words and put together a peace treaty and end this diplomatically. Diplomacy isn't appeasement. It's about finding a solution that ends needless loss of life and prevents the risk of a much larger, possibly nuclear war. Again, this is a geopolitical chess game. In the US and NATO are definitely playing a very, very dangerous role. It's costing us a ton of money, lots of lives are being lost, and the risk of escalation is fucking real. So we have to ask ourselves, like, is this our war to fight? Shouldn't we prioritize diplomatic solutions over endless military escalation? I mean, I think it's really time that we start to rethink our involvement before it's too late. Anyway, as always, feel free to reach out, you know, leave your thoughts in the comments. Let's keep the conversation going. And until next time, stay well, stay wise, and question the narratives around you. I'll see you on the flip side. Mm -hmm.